the part of the myth that I didn't tell you, which I will now tell you, was uh, that uh, naturally, well, they were developing and exploring technical options many hundreds of years ago, and they uh, theoretic they discovered the theoretics for nuclear fusion and fission, but they never used it until. A few hundred years later, one of their great theoreticians, this was after they had discovered our time stream, made the prediction that the physics of atomic explosions were such that they would cross the time stream. And so they performed an experiment by detonating an atomic device in what is our year 1907. And this was yes, the, Tunguska, <laughs> the Tunguska event. And then by monitoring the dreams of Siberian shaman, which they had in clear focus, they saw, aha, this explosion which we set off actually did occur in both time streams. And at that point, they became very interested in monitoring our uh, time stream because they were picking up the dreams of a Swiss telegraph worker who seemed to be pushing toward an unimaginable conclusion. So now there is a certain amount of urgency because if we explode our atomic stockpiles, it will wreck the place that they call home world. Yes, yes. Not self-preservation, because they now have star flight and encompass many systems, but preservation of home world, which on the other side is a vast botanical and ecological preserve from pole to pole. I mean, it's a sacred site of pilgrimage. It's uh, the, the home of the species. It's the earth. And the notion that suddenly great parts of it will be blown apart by leakage from hyperspace of one of our atomic wars is impelling them now to attempt to open the doorway and rejoin the time streams and will be allowed a few years inside the botanical park to acclimate and then most people will ship off for the stars, I imagine. Before I had this idea, I had another idea, which I'll tell you, which is a completely <laughs> different kind of idea. And it's the idea that uh, there is an overmind. This doesn't involve other dimensions. There is an overmind co-present on this planet. And uh, when technology, when the development of technology exceeds the development of ethics, then this overmind can work miracles. And because the overmind is plugged into each of the individual minds that compose it, this miracle always has this unbelievably creepy quality of being exactly the thing which would convince you to change your mind. I mean, in other words, it's like it reads you so perfectly that it's able to present the one situation which you cannot refuse. So in the case of Rome, it was that, you know, Rome was a pigsty. Uh, Pasternak called it a bargain basement on two floors. It ran on slavery, and it ran on brutality and captive populations and an outrageous uh, garrisoning of military power in foreign lands. And uh, it, people like Diophantus, this mathematician I mentioned, and and uh, hero of Alexandria, these people were on the brink of the calculus and the steam engine. So the Overmind, seeing that and seeing their appalling ethical uh, state, sent the miraculous personage of Christ, who in a world where information could not move faster than a horse's gallop, this religion within 60 years was beating at the gates of Rome itself. It was like a fire, you know, just burned through the empire and changed everything and halted technical advance and everything stopped. Now, I created this idea in an effort to explain the UFOs because, you know, the new theory of UFOs or the new school of UFOs says we've been wrong to ask what are they. That has not been fruitful. What we should be doing is asking, what are they doing? 
And we can analyze what they're doing in the same way that we can analyze what anybody is doing through sociological polling of human populations. We can find out what the flying saucers are doing. So they polled human populations, and what they discovered is that what the flying saucers are doing is they are sowing disbelief in science. They cause people to not believe in scientists because scientists come up so lame when asked to explain flying saucers. It's like it is to, it is the, conf the flying saucer is the confounding of, of science in the same way that the resurrection was the complete confounding of Greek Stoicism and, and uh, Democritean materialism in the Roman world. And it's conceivable, you know, that the flying saucer, I mean, the statistics are now something like 12, 11% of the American population have seen a flying saucer, 52% uh, believe flying saucers are real, whatever that <laughs> may mean, and uh, so forth. So it is a, a faith which is percolating up from the lower levels. It's people who live in trailer courts and read Fate magazine who are the staunchest uh, believers in this thing. But what it may be is an intercession on the part of the overmind, which it can do anything. It can do anything from our point of view. And in, in the most extreme version of this idea, I said, what if? enormous spacecraft were to fall into orbit around this planet and what if television images of this craft were to be beamed into every home on the planet and then a teaching revealed some completely mind-boggling thing which you could have thought of it yourself but you never did <laughs> which is always how these things are and and then sut and then after 30 days of uh, melting the nuclear arsenals and causing all cancer to appear and curing all infectious diseases and delivering this message, the enormous spacecraft disappears. 30 days. <laughs> so then everybody says, my God, we have been abandoned. We have been abandoned again into time. And, you know, history would halt. Everybody would do nothing but study the teachings of the saucer and try and figure out how we could get right with them to get them to come back. Dogmatism, theories of communication, priestcraft, the whole thing. So you see, though I'm fascinated by the flying saucer and, the, and what it says about the malleability of mind and matter, I think mature civilizations should not be haunted by messiahs or flying saucers, that these things are like metaphysical spankings imposed from on high that are designed saying, you know, here it's a boot in the tail. Wake up, you know, stop repressing. Well, let's take you two ideas. <clears throat> it's neither one of them is that old. And what does the Overmind have to do with or think of the double time stream? Well, now that's a question I never would have asked. <laughs> <laughs> you mean if that's true? Now, if that was from the Demiurge, is mm -hmm. the Demiurge related to the Overmind? No, I think the Demiurge is like a negative expression of But the created the universe? How did the Overmind get in there to be running the Earth, at least? Well, I think of the overmind as the logos, you know. It's the, it's the understanding and self-existence which permeates everything. And the demiurge is the force of matter and time and cosmic destiny that is always trying to lock in the logos and condition it and make it subject to the rules of the, of the physical universe of space and time. And the Logos is like something from, this is all Gnostic theology, by the way. This is just straight from the book. The Logos is trying to struggle through the labyrinth of the material universe to escape, to rejoin the real source of itself, which is outside of matter. Matter is viewed as a, a, an entrapment. Uh, if any of you have read the late works of Philip K. Dick, he was probing in these areas. He was a genius. His book, Valus, is pure exegesis of his internal he, unravelment of what was going on. And he believed, his take on it was, he believed that from 
A.D. 69 until 1948, no time had actually passed, and that we were living in apostolic time, and that the crucifixion lay only 75 years in the past, and that the Demiurge had inserted a false history, and the Nag Hammadi manuscripts, he believed, were actually the Logos as printed letters, and that when the, when the Nag Hammadi manuscripts were deciphered, it was like this informational creature would come alive and again be present on the earth, that the Logos, beginning in 1948, was beginning to infuse everything, and that shortly it would dissolve the illusion of the intervening 1860 years, or whatever it was, and then we would realize that the prophecy would be fulfilled and that the last days were upon us. That's right, that's right. I'm always trying to, to find physical models for these transcendental hallucinations. And the one which fits this is um, a few years ago, this Scandinavian astronomer Hans Alfven wrote a book called Worlds and Anti-Worlds. And in it he talked about what's called a vacuum fluctuation. A vacuum fluctuation is where suddenly, out of nothingness, there emerge a stream of particles and uh, they are equally particles and antiparticles and they sail along for a period of time and then they collide again and each particle is destroyed by its antiparticle and so what is called parity is conserved meaning that when you add up all the charges positive and negative you get zero so it's okay that this matter came from nothing and returned to nothing. This violates no laws as long as parity is conserved. But the interesting thing about this phenomenon, which is called a vacuum fluctuation, is that there seems in quantum mechanics no rule which would limit the size of such a phenomenon as this. So it's conceivable that our entire universe is an enormous vacuum fluctuation. And it's just, you know, 10 high 72 particles have emerged from nothingness and are hurtling through space. And in another dimension, a parallel dimension, the anti-universe, which is the twin of this universe, is also hurtling through space. And at some point in future time, completely unpredictable, from the state given within each universe, the two will collide and all uh, and parity will be conserved and all particles and antiparticles will disappear. However, the interesting thing is that uh, photons, which is what light is composed of, do not have antiparticles. They're this one weird exception so that when the universe collided with it an its antimatter twin, what would be left would be a universe made only of photons. And those photons would be in the configuration they were in, in the moment when the cosmic collapse of the state vector occurred. Well, we have no idea what the physics of a photonic universe would be about. A limiting case or a good first try would be that it would just be nothing and no life and no self-reflection and no mind. But why posit that? There's such a persistence in, in the perennial philosophy of the notion that spiritual development is somehow related to light and to the cultivation of inner light and to the creation of light bodies and the stabilizing of light. So, uh, you know, it's possible to suggest that the, that the world of the imagination is simply the world of internal light, that it's a world where light is manipulated by thought in the way that in this world, physical organism manipulates matter. And so that, you know, you live in the radiant castles of the imagination after a shift of epochs in which the the photonic mode predominated. That's just one way of imagining it. It's one of the richest meditations there is to try to imagine the millennium. Again, it's this thing, what would you have if you could have anything? 
I mean, sometimes I imagine it, you know, Hieronymus Bosch's great triptych, The Garden of Earthly Delights, where men and women of all races mingle among giant wrens and strawberries and feed each other pomegranates under an autumnal sun in an endless rolling park-like world of exotic vegetables and sexual excess. And, uh, <laughs> Hard stuff to be. <laughs> you can really take a readout on yourself by.